Growing up, I thought I was the poster child of happiness. I stayed out of trouble. I got good grades, and I smiled a lot, a lot. Fast forward to November 27, 2022, to a hospital room. I was with my uncle, who told me with no uncertainty that I had been such a sad little girl. I was taken aback hearing this, you know, because I smiled a lot growing up. You see, I only had one goal showing up to that hospital as one of my uncle's final requests, and that was to bring love and light his way. That's it. Yet here we were, getting very real, very fast, and opening up pieces of my past that I was not prepared to discuss in that hospital with him. Now, when I think about that time, I reflect on how he must have felt. He needed me to know that he saw me and that he loved me beyond any goal that I had set out to accomplish. I have always been enough. And those final moments, although filled with grief, also had moments of deep appreciation and joy that I carry with me still today, beyond the sorrow of him no longer being here. But this was not the first time that I've been aware of carrying two very deep and conflicting feelings at the same time. So who was that little girl that he recalled? Well, I was born in the 80s and was a part of a household impacted by the crack epidemic. Before drugs, my dad was a successful painter at a naval shipyard, and my mom was a stay-at-home wife. Unfortunately, at some point during their relationship, my dad was introduced to the drug that would break our family unit. I experienced my dad's addiction for the rest of my childhood, but it didn't end for him until I was almost 30 years old. He was a major part of my life as a child, and we experienced the highest of highs and and the lowest of lows um, that normalized an unhealthy way of living where we faced periods without electricity and gas and multiple evictions. And I suppose because of his addiction, I never knew (laughs) what I would experience with my dad. At times, he felt like he was my best friend. And at other times, I felt like I was his parent. So instead of telling him to go to school, I would beg him to go to work so we could pay bills and have food to eat. I was embarrassed and masking what was happening at home, even from my mom. She didn't live with us, so she didn't have a clue. At other times, I saw my dad defining his own path with his life. And that made me feel as though I could accomplish anything, or at least try it at least once, right? (sighs) No matter how many failed businesses he tried, he never stopped believing that maybe the next business would be the one. And because of that, that's why failure doesn't scare me today. I see it as new lessons that I can apply to new and existing things. And through my dad, I witnessed lessons that I would never have to learn on my own, which led me to define my own path, try new things, and create a life that I truly wanted. His main business was a house painter, and he had this really incredible gift of connecting with people. Maybe I got that from him. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and it helped him to provide for us. When he did secure these gigs, he introduced me to individuals living these opulent lifestyles, or what I believed to be opulent lifestyles at the time. And they embraced me, and they shared their time, and I saw glimmers of my future in them. I saw the possibilities beyond my current circumstances. And you know what? I am really proud of my dad. He didn't finish high school, and he was so proud of me for being smart. He used to have me write common sight words on a piece of paper so he could write estimates and contracts for his clients when I was a kid. Both of my parents only had one goal for me, and that was to graduate high school. Check. 
<laughs> he also earned his GED years later and became a licensed contractor. Now, my current state, decades later, is a direct result of what I experienced growing up. I experienced moments of deep sorrow and waves of resilience and joy. And with so much out of my control, it shouldn't be any wonder that I work hard to find and hold on to joy whenever and wherever I can. Joy has always proven to be around the corner of my sorrows. But it's those spaces in between that I continue to explore today. And I've come to realize it and recognize it and celebrate the highs. And I can acknowledge the lows, but choosing joy amidst adversity is an art that I curate every day. I've come to think of it as resilient joy. You know, that joy that still finds its way to me, no matter what else is going on, it's that kind of joy that holds on tight. For instance, when I think of resilient joy, I see my oldest son, Gerard. He has a few disabilities, including autism, epilepsy, and adrenal insufficiency. He's truly oblivious to the world and how others may experience him. Instead, he walks with an incredible sense of pride and confidence and stands firm in the decisions he makes for his life. And in turn, I celebrate all of his wins, no matter how big or small, because I see the joy in the miracle of his life. This doesn't mean that as his mother, I don't experience sorrow. There is nothing beautiful about watching your child suffer through seizures or adrenal crises. This is a part of the in-between where joy and sorrow coexist. My son Gerard has been a source of joy for me, and his silent pride and his contagious smile continue to motivate and inspire me to keep moving forward and celebrate my joys and the joys that others share with me. In recent years, I've come to see myself as a practitioner of joy. But the funny thing is this, I've been on a joy-seeking journey my whole life. But I thought that this all began with the pandemic. What I've come to realize is that the pandemic was my first opportunity to just be still, to just stop, and to just be, maybe for the first time in my life. One of my dear cousins once told me that my staying busy and setting so many of my goals was a trauma response to my upbringing and the desire to never repeat it. <laughs> what? <laughs> but you know what? She was right. She was right. I spent so many years building my skills, completing my doctoral degree, and, and climbing this professional growth ladder. As a military spouse, a first-generation college graduate, a mom of two, one son a special needs adult, and a person living with disabilities myself, I felt that so much of my time consisted of supporting others and making it work, whatever it may be. And while I was navigating moments of sitting still within the pandemic, I encountered new experiences at work as well. Everything was shifting and it brought me back to pieces of my childhood that were just out of my control. I was quickly losing sight of myself and knew that I would need to make some changes fast. So I decided to lean into what I knew best, and that was finding my joy. Only this time, it was different. I knew that I needed to be much more intentional about how I captured it. I toyed with the idea of starting a joy jar. You know, one of those jars, you write down your joys, you put them in the little jar, maybe you pull them out and read it and say, oh, joy, and then put it back, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I decided to buy a journal instead. And I couldn't imagine back then where it would lead me today. My goodness, okay, 
So the more I journaled about my joys, the more I saw that joy was all around me. And I could no longer keep this goodness to myself. For instance, I would be in meetings and someone would share great news and I would proclaim the experience as my joy of the day. I needed my colleagues to know that our time together meant something to me. I also started to tell anyone willing to listen about my joy journal. And for those of you who know this to be true, thank you so much for letting me share, and, and I hope that it helped you reflect on your own joys. I also learned that my joy was deeply rooted in family, self-discovery, and friendship. I was so surprised that most of my joy did not come from achieving the next big thing in my career. My joy, whew, it comes from authentic relationships. I also decided that it was okay to, you know, soften my life a little bit. So I read for fun, I made time to frolic, and I, you know, discovered new interests along the way. And I purchased a pink futon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I placed it in my office, hmm. of all places. But you know what? I was creating a space for me. And I purposely chose interests that would not result in monetary rewards. I didn't want this to feel like another job. OK, so I had very few rules when it came to writing in this journal. I vowed to write at least one joy of the day in this journal before going to bed every night. And I did this for up to a year. I knew that this would not be my forever activity. This was just a tool that I chose to do to be more intentional about acknowledging the joys that are happening in my life every day. <sighs> now, I thought about how my husband would ask me over the day, uh, through the years, about how my day was. And I remember how quickly I could tell him all of the problems. I was ready to spill all the tea. You see, I remember how I felt after releasing all that negativity. And because I'm human, I must admit that sometimes it felt so good, really good. But most of the time, there was no resolution to what I shared in sight. And I wanted to change that feeling because I was not recognizing the small wins as much as I'd like. And great things were happening in between all of that chaos every single day. I knew I was onto something when my eight-year-old Corey asked me what my joy of the day was. Y'all, I froze and I just started beaming from within. Because when people around you start to imitate you, for better or worse, you are making an impact. And my baby told me so. So just when I believed I had grasped the essence of joy and the role that it plays in my life, no matter what, this past year brought me the ultimate challenge. Losing my beloved uncle at the beginning of the year. And then shockingly, my mother near its end. I know you heard a lot about my dad earlier, right? And he was certainly an important and complex part of my upbringing. But what I'm realizing more and more with her passing is that my mom was my everything. My mom, Gloria, now that was my BFF. And that friendship did not end as adults. She and I delighted in the time we spent together and that delight was echoed in her relationship with my boys. Seeing my boys with my mom for the last time was joy and sorrow coexisting. In hospice, she fought to sit up and act like she was okay, even apologizing for needing to lay back down. She didn't need to do that. A joy for me was doing her hair and holding her hand as much as I could. And I loved watching her watch the boys play. 
even if it was on their phones, whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> we would leave for an hour or two at a time, you know, so she could relax. And I gave her all of the hugs and kisses when I returned. There were just endless hugs and kisses. I just needed her to feel me. And I told her how much I loved her so many times. It was like the only thing I knew to do was just tell her I love her incessantly. And, and she took it every time. She'd just say, I love you too, love you too, love you too, proud, love you, love you too. Um, and I took it. Um, <laughs> and in true Gloria fashion, she wanted a couple of outfit changes in hospice because she wanted to take pictures with me and the boys. It was a joy to witness all of the strength that she had and the need to take photos. That was something that she loved to do. And she wanted to capture those memories so she could look at them when we weren't there. She passed a week later. Now we have those pictures. Throughout this season of my life, I've been able to confirm that my mom transferred so much of her light to me. I hear her in my laugh. I see her in my gap tooth smile. <sighs> and I collected so many beautiful memories along the way. And yes, I am grateful that her joy is mine. It is mine. It is mine. Her ability to harness joy at the saddest part of her life confirmed that my mom could feel deep, radical joy for me and others while experiencing personal sorrow and grief for herself. It also reaffirms that I can feel deep and immense joy for myself and others while fighting the good fight, recognizing those small wins, and navigating all of the in-betweens of life. Thank you. Thank you.